We don't read of Nehemiah having any specific blueprints, but he certainly was a builder, very methodical. Nehemiah chapter 3, you can read that, and all he does there is he takes every family, every group of people, and he positions to work in a very orderly manner. So he's definitely a builder. He's definitely an engineer who works to rebuild the wall. It doesn't take them long, and they get the job done, but there is an enemy who wants to stop them. His name is Sam Ballad. Likewise, you have an enemy named Satan. The last thing he wants you to do is to restore your mind because then you are a threat to his kingdom and you can also accomplish the purpose that God has for your life. God designed you for something. He is your architect and he has a specific purpose for your life. And so this morning, I want to use blueprints as an example for that. Uh, I have here with me this morning a set of blueprints. These are the blueprints that we used when we renovated our church building in 2002, and we did what we called an extreme makeover. We moved out of the building for a couple of years, and we went to work, and uh, this, these are the set of drawings that we had for, for the renovation. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you've seen blueprints, they, they can get quite marked up and quite used and, and even tattered as they go through it. But I wanted to show you one picture here this morning. I thought this would be of interest to you, uh, if I can find the right page. Lots of drawings, lots of details, um, you know, and they get all, all marked up and all used. And go to this next page. Oh, where is it? Oh, I'll find it. Here it is. I want you to see this page, especially you that are here in the sanctuary this morning. You see this page here? This is the sanctuary. This is where you're sitting. You're sitting in this. Let me ask you this morning, are you really here? Yes. You know, are you really here? You're really in this building, right? Well, you know, a number of years ago, this was just a dream. It was just ink on paper. But today it's a reality. You know what happens when you take a blueprint? You study it, you look at it, you go back and forth to it, and it ends up becoming a reality. On its own, this is just ink and paper. On its own, it can be kind of boring. Brad, what you shared in overtime last night, that was, that was so good. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna say it. If you'll, no, no, I want you to share it. It was so good. He had something so good in overtime last night, an application of this that's good for any parent or any, anybody. But I'll let him, let, you, you, don't forget to talk about that because it was so good. You're going to have anticipation now, so you can, <laughs> it was good. And those that are doing their own overtime at the, at the campuses, quickly text Brad, he can give you the notes. <laughs> but this is a reality. We're here. It's fantastic. Across the street is the Paradox Hotel. It's the second tallest building in the city. It's a reality. You can look across and actually see it. When they were building it, they were digging the hole. It went like 100 feet deep, a, a deep dig to build a tall building. You have to go deep to go high. Same thing in your life. Go deep to go high. If you want a shack, you don't need to do that. But if you really want your life to count, you'll have to do that. So I received permission to go over there, and I went into the engineer shack they had there. And they had these blueprints laid out, maybe like six like this laid out. And uh, I went over to the blueprints and I was looking at them. It was a beehive, you guys. People were coming and going all the time. Electricians came in, plumbers came in. There's a legend for the electrician. There's a legend for the plumber. And they'd come in and they'd look at this. And they'd take, okay, I got that. They'd run over, they'd do their work. Then they'd come back, let me double check that. Oh, yes, that's what I need. There's some coffee stains on the blueprint. They're penciled up here and there. They were reflecting on the blueprint. Amen? They're thinking about the blueprint. You could say they're meditating on the blueprint. They're chewing on it. They're ruminating on it because what they see there, they want to bring into reality. Now, what you see in your Bible is the blueprint for your mind. And as much as that worker needs to go to the blueprint and needs to look at it, go back, double check, because the architect has given him notes on how to do something on this front page, 
It's called sprinkler notes. And the only way the sprinklers work is you keep going back to this. Well, God has lots of notes for you on how to rebuild your mind. But wouldn't it be a shame if the builders said, I got this. I built a couple buildings before. I watched a couple YouTube videos. And I watched some TikTok. I got this. I can wing it. I don't want to be in that building. It's not going to be a success. Do you know God really, really wants you to be successful? He wants you to live a blessed life. But the only way that happens is if you follow the blueprint. Arthur Erickson was the one who designed the building across the street. A brilliant architect. We celebrate him in our province. But the only way that that works is if you follow Arthur Erickson's instructions. You could look at the paradox building across the street and say, that's the building that Arthur Erickson built. He wasn't on the job site, didn't put any rebar, any glass in, but he built it because they followed his design. Likewise, you could say, this is the mind that God built because I followed his design. Are you tracking with me? You can build a lot of things in your life. You could build a house. You could build a high rise. You could build a website. You could build a car. The most important thing that you'll ever build in your life is your mind. You could build a garden, you could build a road, but the most important thing ever built in your life is your mind. And God is the architect, he has the blueprint for it. Those words on here, ink on here, it's just, it's potential. It has the potential to look like right where you're sitting. In physics, we call it potential energy. If I had a ball sitting on top of a hill, it has potential energy. But if a force comes along and pushes that ball, it now rolls down the hill and it's now kinetic energy. You're sitting in what could be called kinetic. It was potential here, but now because energy has been applied, there's actually a reality. The same thing happens in the spiritual realm. God's word, potential, right? You could have a hundred Bibles in your house. You could go even go to sleep with a Bible on, under your head. You can go to sleep with a Bible under your head. It will not renew your mind. And you could take your Bible and, you know, you could, you could wave it at something and think, oh, this will stop the vampires. No, <laughs> that won't work. But, you, but it's the Bible. It's potential. The potential is there, but it only becomes kinetic when you apply it, when you do it. So the question that needs to be asked is, well, what takes it from potential to kinetic? What is the force that moves it? What gets the ball rolling? Now, don't miss this. Your mouth. Your mouth pushes the ball so it goes from potential to kinetic. It's God's word full of energy. Yes is the right answer. <laughs> it's full of energy. It's full of power, right? Well, how do I get it work in my life? Speak it. Look at this verse, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God, the word of God is living and powerful. Another word says it's energized, because that's the Greek word, energy that it's coming from. It's powerful, it's energy. But if it's sitting in your night table, you could have a Gideon's Bible in the hotel room, and you could be tormenting your mind, and it's not helping you because it's not being activated. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. So there's other two-edged swords out there. Proverbs says that the, the lips of an adulterer are like a two-edged sword. There's other words that are spoken out there. There's other weapons. But the word of God is sharper than them. Now, two-edged, you have to, we have to know this. It's a Greek word, make two words combined, diastomos. And it literally means two-mouthed. 
Word of God is a two-mouth sword. Wouldn't it make more sense to say a two-edged sword? Why does the Bible say two-mouth sword? Why this word stomas here? Would you agree that God spoke the word and it was written down for us? So his mouth has spoken it, so that's once. What makes it diastomas? What makes it two? My mouth. See, God spoke it once, here it is. But when I speak it, now it's diastomas. Now it's two-mouthed. That's what takes the word of God and it activates it in your life. It goes from a blueprint into reality. It really does. Look at these other verses. I'll give you a few more. Revelations 1.16, talking about Jesus. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth, out of the stomas, went a sharp two-edged sword, diastomas, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Out of his stoma, out of his mouth. Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the stoma speaks, the mouth speaks. You see that the heart is connected to the mouth. The way the blueprint comes into existence is by speaking it out. The whole world came into existence by God speaking. Your world changes when you speak God's word. You're taking his blueprint and you're speaking it into reality. As much as you're really sitting in these pews today, you really will have a different life as you renew your mind. It's going to happen. It's going to change. Look at Romans 10.10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So I believe in my heart, but when I speak it out of my mouth, I have salvation. So what's salvation? Salvation means, yes, you're going to heaven, but it means more than that. It means soundness of mind, prosperity, preservation. So it's a, it's a bigger package than a ticket to heaven. It's your life being affected by God's grace and mercy right now. However, it's conditional. Having a Bible is not enough. You have to read it, apply it, speak it, and then what's in the blueprint becomes a reality. Okay, we have, we have to keep going here. There's a lot to cover today. God's word is a blueprint for a healthy mind. Look at Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Blessed. How many here this morning want to be blessed? Okay, how many are watching online want to be blessed? At Alpha Weekend, you want to be blessed? I think we all want to be blessed. If you don't want to be blessed, there's probably something wrong between your ears. <laughs> Because it's normal to want God's blessing on your life. That's where we're created. Blessed is the person who does not follow the advice of the wicked people. Take the path of sinners or join the company of mockers. If he was writing it today, the psalmist might say, who doesn't get involved in dark threads, who doesn't get involved in TikTok and other things and get, get snagged in those mocking conversations. Not so quiet in here, I'm not sure why. <laughs> but you can get roped into this thread that's like, what am I doing on here? I'm in the company of mockers. Especially in a day when there's a lot of politics going on. And somebody's being mocked, and like every, if you're a politician, I think you just have to know you're going to be mocked. But let's not be the ones doing the mocking, amen? Let's not join that company. Rather, he delights or she delights in his teaching. Delights in his teaching. The teachings of the Lord. And reflects on the teachings day and night. So, here's this, here's this blueprint again. Now, on its own, I mean, this is not the most interesting reading material, okay? But we delight in it. You know why I delighted in this blueprint? Because we saw the finished product. We delighted in it because we saw what was going to be here. We saw it today. That's why we delighted in it. 
A number of years ago, Cheryl and I built a house, and uh, we had a set of blueprints, and we delighted in the blueprint. You know why? Because we saw where the fireplace is going to be. We saw where the kids' rooms were going to be. We saw where our, our kitchen was going to be. And we delighted in it because we saw what was going to be a reality. So when you see God's word, you delight in it because what is in God's word, those promises are what you are really, really, really going to experience. So that's why we delight in his teachings of the Lord. And we reflect on his teachings day and night. When we were building our house, we'd reflect on this. We'd meditate on it. We'd think, even in the evening, we'd be thinking, you know what, I wonder if we did this, or how did that work? How's that going to fit in there? We were thinking about the project. Again, the most important project that you'll ever work on is your mind. And you'll work on it your entire life. When we come to faith in Christ, we do a major renovation. And from there on, we're continually guarding our mind, guarding our thoughts. So we want to, we want to delight. We want to reflect on his word. You know, when you think about a problem over and over again, that's called worry. And when you think about God's promises over and over again, that's called meditate. So guess what? If you can worry, you can meditate. <laughs> all you have to do is flip the switch. Instead of thinking about all your problems and worrying, you think about God's problems I mean, God's, God's promises instead of the problems. In Psalm 19, verse 7, it says, the instructions of the Lord are perfect. This blueprint is good, but it's not perfect. Anybody who's worked on a construction site at some time or another will say, that architect had a good idea, but there's no way we could make that happen. <laughs> Not so with God's word. It's perfect. Instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The, discree, the decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. It, it changes you. You say, well, I'm a, I'm a simple person. I'm not as smart as somebody else. God's smart. Meditate on his thoughts, and it will revive your soul. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soulish realm, rebuilding the walls. But you have to meditate on them. We have to inspect the thought. Not every thought should be coming into our head. Not every thought should be meditated upon. I want to meditate on his plans, not other plans. Psalm 101 verse 3 says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the works of those who fall away from me, from you. I'm going to watch what I set before my eyes. And you are given lots of opportunities to set things before your eyes. More so than any other generation that's ever lived on the planet, you have an opportunity to set things before your eyes. Be careful what comes in to your mind. Guard your heart with all diligence. If you follow the wicked, you're going to end up with strongholds in your life, negative strongholds. I'm going to put on, a, on the screen here uh, the pathway to a negative stronghold. What you don't want to have is a negative stronghold in your life. This is where you're, you're handcuffed. This is where you're in bondage to fear. This is where you're incapacitated, where the things that you want to do aren't being done because you're just bogged down and you're held captive. This is not where God wants you, but there's a progression to get there. The trapper takes his time to get you there, and he, there's a pattern that follows. It starts with a thought. It's an initial idea or an impulse. Then it moves into consideration where you weigh out this thought. Then you develop a mindset towards it. An attitude begins, and then you start taking action on that based on your attitude. And you keep doing that, and you have this repeated behavior, and a habit forms, and you end up with a, a stronghold in your mind. Let me give you an example. Let's say there's this professional guy, he goes to work, and at work, his boss gives him some constructive criticism. He says, you know, you need to be changing this and this, and you'll be, you'll be much better. And so he, he has a thought that comes out of that, and his thought was, Boy, he said that to me, I don't think I'm good enough. And he has just this little thought, I don't think I'm good enough. Now, what could he do with that thought? He could entertain that thought, or he could repel that thought. But let's say he considers that thought, and he begins to weigh it, and begins to mutter it, and go over it, and he meditates on that. He says, well, I'm not good enough. 
I failed here one time. I failed that class in grade 10, and I dropped out of that. And so he begins to consider it, begins to dwell on it, his past failures. And after a while, his attitude begins to change, and he picks up what we would call a pessimistic outlook on life. And then his attitude begins to be self-doubt and low self-esteem begins to creep in. He's a professional, but these things are beginning to bother him. And then he begins to act on it. He's taking some action on it. Projects come up, challenges come up, and he steps back from me. He says, I'm not good enough. I heard this word and I've been replaying it in my mind. And so his actions are changing. And pretty soon that becomes a habit, it becomes second nature for him. So now, not just withdrawing once, he has this habit of withdrawing and pulling back, and there's this pattern that's happening in his life. And before long, he has a stronghold, and he feels like, I'm a failure, I'm incapable of achieving success, and he lives with this negative self-perception. And what started just as a thought ends up as a stronghold, and they're not achieving what they could with their life. So how do we get rid of strongholds? They say, oh, that's happened in my life. I, I've done that. I'm there. What do we do? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Look at this verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For what? For pulling down strongholds. Aren't you glad God said that? I am, because I've done that. I have taken a thought, considered it, and I went down that path, and I've ended up with a stronghold in my mind, and I'm so glad, says, he doesn't, God doesn't say to me, David, that's your own dumb fault. You should have taken that thought captive way back when, but you entertained it, you allowed it to get into you. Good luck with that. He doesn't do that, my friend. He says, no, no, I will give you a weapon to pull down that stronghold. It's going, it's no longer to have your life. Boy, that's good news. We do something here at Coastal on a regular basis at our campuses. I know, uh, Pastor Kevin, you just did it there at Pitt Meadows, a spiritual cleansing day where we just take a day. One of the things we deal with is rejection. That illustration I gave you is of somebody who, who took it a thought of rejection. And we deal with a whole day of just pulling down strongholds. You don't have to go to a day like that to do it, but it, it's, a, it's coaching and teaching on how to do it. That's why we run freedom sessions, tools to pull down strongholds, because the weapons are mighty to pull down strongholds, casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity. Every thought. How many thoughts a day do you have? About 50,000. So before you consider them and allow them into your life, into your garden, so to speak, into your mind, you have to say, wait a minute, I'm going to take that thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Last week, Pastor Carlin was here. He talked about be governed by the spirit, don't be governed by the flesh. If you're governed by the flesh, it means your appetites, you do whatever it wants it to do. Instead of allowing your spirit to rule your life, you let your flesh rule your life. The flesh will get you into the ditch every time. My flesh likes to eat six pieces of banana cream pie. How many know if I do that, I'm going to end up in a ditch? <laughs> I'm not going to be healthy. That's a, maybe a simple example, but your flesh has certain appetites, and you're to control those appetites. The Holy Spirit is to be the governor of your life. That's why there's no condemnation. I'm not letting the flesh govern me. I'm not letting the dictates of the world rule my life. I'm going to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I'm going to inspect every thought that comes in and decide whether or not I want it to be resident in my mind, in my heart. We've shared this example before. It's good to repeat it. At our YVR airport, every passenger is inspected. Amen? Amen. You ask for your passport, why are you here, what do you bring to this country, etc. And if you come with terrorism, if you come with an evil agenda, we turn you back. You don't get to come into this country. That's called border control. Your mind has to have border control, wall control. And we take that person captive to the obedience of the Canadian government. 
They work for the Canadian government. They govern what comes into our country. Likewise, I am under the governance of the Lord Jesus Christ, and every thought that comes along, I'm not my own. I belong to Jesus. As Pastor Jess was sharing earlier, I am a child of God. So under God's governance, that thought does not belong here. I check the blueprint, you don't belong here. And so I push it back. That leads to freedom. That leads to the success we wanted to talk about earlier. Mark chapter 7, verses 20 to 22. Here's a good verse. Jesus said, the things that make people wrong are the things that come from the what? Inside. What's going on in here? All these bad things begin inside a person where, what does it say? In the mind. So when you see bad things happening in bad people, it didn't just happen that day. Something's been going on here. There's a bad stronghold in their mind. All these bad things begin inside a person in the mind. Bad thoughts, sexual sins, stealing, murder, adultery, greed, doing bad things to people, lying, doing things that are morally wrong, jealousy, insulting people, proud talking, and foolish living. Our goal is to say, that stuff doesn't get in my mind. I'm going to put a control on that. I'm not going to let it come into my mind. Not easy to do, you say. You're right. But the Holy Spirit says, I want to help you. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, 21 to 23. Since you've heard about Jesus and learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Now look at this last verse here. Look at this carefully. Instead, read this with me. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. It's a choice. I let you, Holy Spirit, renew my thoughts. I allow you. Just as Nehemiah came to Jerusalem, I say, I allow you, Holy Spirit, come and renew my thoughts. God really wants you to be blessed. He doesn't want you to live in fear. He doesn't want you to have a battle in your mind. He wants you to have the peace, the strength, so you can accomplish what God's called you to do. But the only way we do that is by following the blueprint and saying, come Holy Spirit, help me to do this. And for some of us, on the outside, it looks so good. It looks like we have it all together. But if you're honest, between here, you know you need the Holy Spirit to help you. We need to say, come Holy Spirit. If we don't, you'll be at the same place next year. He really does want you to be blessed. He really does want you to have a peace that passes all understanding. He really wants you to sleep well. And some of us, we're carrying things we're not supposed to. Some of you this morning, you're, you're trying to do God's job. And one of the things to a peaceful mind is to give to God what's God's. You're worrying about stuff that's not your responsibility. He, he'll do his part as you do your part. So let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us. In just a moment, we're going to sing that song. I asked Brad, I said, let's sing that song, The Blessing Again. The Lord keep you. The Lord's for you. The Lord's with you. The biggest battle you'll beat, win, is the battle in your mind. The biggest construction job you have, the biggest building project you have, is your mind. And the Lord's with you. The Lord's for you. We live in a province, you guys, that's challenged with mental health issues. Makes me weep when I see how many people have gone through with MAID and other things. They didn't have to go there. They didn't have to turn to drugs. They didn't need a needle. 
Where did it all start? It started here. Come on. We don't have to have that. Your, your friends don't have to have that. There's a blueprint. There's an answer. But if you just let it sit there, it's not going to work. You have to fuss over it, re reflect on it. You really have to do it. But his promise is, I will give you peace. It takes some work. It takes some effort. But it's so worth it.